each one of you here after almost a year. Um, uh, I know, I don't know if I look any different. Uh, don't answer that. Uh, uh, but uh, it's glad to see each one of you. Uh, and uh, we are in the series of the book of Acts. And uh, we have crossed into, last week we crossed into chapter 10. And um, last week we co started covering Peter's witness after seeing, uh, you know, a glimpse of other people in the book of Acts. We're now coming back to Peter once again in his ministry. And uh, today we're going to cover the well-known um, incident of uh, Cornelius and Peter, the dreams they had and their encounter and what transpired as a result. And so far in the book of Acts, we're seeing several milestones in the early church. The first milestone that we all know is that what happened on the day of Pentecost, right? And, and there uh, we see the fruition of Jesus' command and his words that the power of the Holy Spirit will come upon them. They become witnesses. And they become witnesses that moment in Jerusalem and primarily and then into some parts of Judea. And the second milestone is, uh, in my opinion, is the stoning of Stephen and the, and the, and the death of Stephen and, and the scattering that happens as a result, the, the heat of persecution that comes upon the early church and the, which causes the church to scatter into not just all of Judea but into Samaria and, and other distant lands. And the third milestone is what we covered in the last few weeks, which is the, the conversion of Saul of Tarsus to Paul. And we see Paul for a, a moment of time, a short moment of time. He does some ministry, but then he is hidden, as we know, for a, a, a season. And today we're going to cover the fourth milestone of the order of the church. And, and what I, I what would like us to think about when we read, these, read this chapter is seeing the hand of God in, at work in the life, not only of Peter, but also in Cornelius. And how God orchestrates his ways to, uh, to bring out his purpose. And so, you know, if you remember Peter's first uh, sermon to, uh, at the day of Pentecost, he said, this promise of the Holy Spirit, or this gospel, is for, not just for you, but also for your children and those who are far off. And, and what we're going to see today is that even Peter did not realize the words that he was speaking was actually prophetic in nature, that it included not just the, the uh, diaspora Jews, but it included the, so, the, 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 the rede uh, irredeemable Gentiles as well. And, and, and so today we're going to see how the prejudice of Peter is, is used and changed by the power of the gospel. So... What I would like us to do today, what I'm thinking of doing today is just reading through all of chapter 10. I won't speak about every verse, but as the Spirit leads, I'm just going to pause and, and, and talk about um, whatever the Lord has laid in my heart. So before we do that, let us, uh, let us bow our heads in prayer and let us seek, seek the, the Lord in this. Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise you, Lord, for this morning. Lord, we thank you for these living oracles that you've given to us, God. Thank you for the word of God. And we pray, Lord, that as we hear from your word, that our ears will be open to hear the wondrous truths of your word, that our hearts will be softened and fertile. Lord, I pray that you would use my weak words, my weak intellect. By the power of the Spirit, I pray that you speak life-giving words to your people, O oh Lord. I pray, O oh God, that you would challenge us, you will encourage us, you will bring joy in us. Lord God, you will ch bring change in us through this word. I pray, O oh God, that you would bring multitude of fruit, O oh God, from this. We give you all the praise, glory, honor, O oh God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So let's dig in. Um, Acts chapter 10, verse 1 onwards. At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort. A devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms 
generously to the people and prayed continually to God. So Cornelius is, as you can imagine, he's a Roman uh, soldier. He's a, he's, a, he's a military officer. He commands, because he's a centurion, we know from that word alone that there's 100 men in his, under his control. We know about centurions from the Gospels as well. If you remember the centurion that Jesus said, was marveled at, his faith, right? And so this is another centurion, I believe, and his name is Cornelius. And he happened to pray to the, the God of Israel, and not just him, but all of his household. And he did all the Jewish things, especially when it came to giving alms or giving support, helping the poor. And he prayed continually to God. And we see here that, uh, as we're going to read in verse 3, he says, About the ninth hour of the day, he clearly saw in a vision an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. So, you know, the Jewish tradition is that in, that it, there, in every third hour there's a time of prayer and this is the ninth hour about 3 p.m. he's praying as as if a, a Jewish person would pray and he sees a vision of the angel of God verse 4 he said he said he stares at him in terror and says what is it Lord and he says to him your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God I mean it, when you think about this that the that this man, who is not, you wouldn't call him a full Jew, but yet his earnest efforts to pray and to give and to follow, even just the basic Jewish practices, have ascended to heaven as, as a pleasing sacrifice. There's a, the, the terminology here is like the Old Testament sacrificial system. This is after the sacrifice of Christ. So, you know, it is kind of a mystery that... Can God hear the prayers of those who are not Christian? And here it gives you an, a sense that there, there is, there, God can. It has nothing to do with salvation or anything like that, but God sees everyone. God's, God's eyes are to, uh, running to and fro in the earth to find those who fear Him. And, and this is how we should take it, is that we should not just blankly assume that God just ignores non-Christians or God ignores non-Jews. God is seeing it all. And he says, verse 6 or verse uh, 5, And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner whose house is by the sea. And when the angels who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. Verse 9. The, the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the housetop about the sixth hour to pray. Again, we're seeing a common thread here between Cornelius and Peter, right? Both are praying and we're going to see here that Peter is about to see a, a vision. And Peter is uh, praying at the sixth hour, which is noon. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens opened and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. And in it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air, Again, this vision, we're going to see what, how Peter uh, deciphers this vision. But this, just, just to give a basic, uh, um, a basic description, we're seeing a sheet with the four corners, which represents really the four corners of the earth and all kinds of animals and reptiles in, uh, of the air in, upon that sheet being presented to Peter. Verse 13, And there came a voice said to him, Rise, Peter, Kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Peter may have thought this was a test of some kind, you know, test of his faithfulness and test of his you know, diligence to, to follow the law. So, and you can also see Peter's 
you know, instant reaction, this disgust that you're telling me to kill and eat this? I mean, th- this, is not, this is not lawful according to Jewish customs. Verse 15, it says, And the voice came to him again and said, said a second time, What the Lord has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. I mean, there's so much you can say about verse 15 alone. You know, what God has made clean, do not call common. Peter ought to know this, right, from, if you remember the Gospels, Jesus said that it's not what goes into your, uh, what, you, what goes into man that makes him unclean, but what comes out of man. And, and in brackets, and I think it's in the Gospel of Mark, it says, by this Jesus, Jesus called all food clean. So it, it should not be an alien concept to Peter, but what we're seeing here is that God is discipling and God is shepherding Peter through his prejudice about this one issue. And when we read further, we'll find out it's not just about food. Food is there, but it is much bigger than that. In the nature of vision itself, verse 16, this happened three times. And I don't know how many of you have had visions and dreams from the Lord, but this, this is kind of a, 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 a pattern that with those who see visions from the Lord, it, it, it's very vague, it's very unclear. In verse 17, it says, Now while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, you know, this is, a, this is normal when we hear a voice from the Lord, when we see visions from the Lord. And again, it is not something that everyone ought to experience, but when it happens, it, it confuses us. It, it brings a kind of, it, it, we try to, we're trying to decipher this because it's so random. I mean, just think about this. Such a random vision that comes to Peter. Yes, of course, he was hungry at noon, but beyond that, just to see all these animals and, 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 and a voice saying to kill it, it, it just seems so out of norm. And it says, while he was inwardly perplexed, uh, behold, while he was thinking about these things, behold, the men that were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called, to, called out to ask whether Simon, who was Peter, was lodging there. And while he was pondering the vision, the Spirit said to him, Behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. Just think about the timing of God. Timing of God, while he is pondering these things, while he's thinking about these things, three men are coming. And just think, just look at what the Spirit of God tells him. He's saying, Accompany them, go down and accompany them without hesitation. So what is the Spirit of God really dealing with Peter here? There's a, you know, that's with anything. that When, when the Lord speaks to us something really tough, when the, when the Lord shows us really something tough, there is a, there's a tendency to hesitate. And the Spirit of God is telling Peter, do not hesitate. And, and, and we'll see here, that's all he says. That's all the Spirit of God says. That's all the vision says. He doesn't talk about a man named Cornelius. You know, uh, he, God doesn't say what to do, right? He just says, just go with them. And this is kind of how the Lord speaks to us in, in very unclear but clear terms. And we'll see what Peter does, right? So Peter went down, verse 21, went down to the men and said, I am the one you're looking for. What is the reason for your coming? And, and they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who was well-spoken by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to his house and hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guests. So Peter shows the courtesy of Jewish hospitality in inviting these soldiers to come stay with, uh, with them, with him. So the next day they rose up and they went away with them and some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied them. This, this, uh, having these witnesses come help, it comes uh, uh, helpful as we read this story. On the following day, they entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. And when Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter lifted him up saying, Stand up, I too am a man. 
That's something to also to ponder about. The, the tendency that man, man has to, to worship and put people on pedestals, people that seemingly have a direct line with God are put up into pedestals that they do not deserve. And it, it ought to be each one, of our, uh, each one of our responsibility to clarify and to tell people, I am just a man just like you are. I, I am, I'm no special than anyone else. And, and this is a tendency that we see again and again in the church of putting up God men, God men or God, God women into positions and into heights that they should not be in. And here Peter, in all humility, is saying, I am just a man. Stand up. Don't, don't venerate me. Don't worship me like God or like Caesar or something like that. I'm just a man. Verse 27, as he talked with them, he went in and found many persons gathered. And he said to them, you yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. Again, this is how he has interpreted the vision. When he saw the animals and he saw, all of a sudden he saw people coming at the right time and he's pondering these things and the Spirit of God says, go with them. This is how Peter has, has deciphered his vision that he should not call any person, not just the food, but the persons, common or unclean. And we, we don't understand how how drastic of a step this is for Peter to, um, to do this. Nowadays, I mean, we, we were so removed from that century that the, how Jewish people were separated, it was, at least the faithful ones were so separated from Gentiles, they could not have any kind of fellowship. And here's God arranging in his ways, right, two people. And, 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 and there, and Peter brings his witnesses Cornelius brings his relatives and friends, and there's this encounter that happens that God arranges. And Cornelius said, and I'm going to skip uh, what he, he says the same thing that we see in the beginning of chapter, so I'm going to skip to um, the end 33, verse 33. So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now therefore we are all here in the presence of God to hear all you have been commanded by the Lord. I mean, what a faith and what an attitude from, from Cornelius. Even the attitude that sometimes we don't have. When we are in the presence of God like we are here this morning, to have an attitude saying, we are here in the presence of God to hear all that you have been commanded by the Lord. I mean, what a weight that is on someone like me. What a weight is that on someone like each one of you that are in the pews to have to weigh this heavily, that anything that's said here ought to be done by the direction and command of the Lord, and anything that we hear from there ought to be taken as if it is from the Lord. And having this, uh, also this, uh, this mentality of knowing that the presence of God is here. And just think about the weightiness of that moment, right? Peter is there, oh, his, his uh, posse is there, and you got you know, Cornelius and his folks Something is about to go down. They know that, that this is, something is about to happen. Uh, and just think about, just put yourself in that moment. I wish we were there. Just, just wait. There's, it's a weighty moment that's about to happen. Um, and then verse 34 onwards, my time is short. So, um, he's, and so I'm just going to be really brief. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, every, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. Peter preaches the gospel. He, you know, like God didn't say, had to say, go preach the gospel. This is so in nature with Peter. The opportunity he got to speak, he didn't have to tell a story or tell something else. Or, or, you know, you know make, make small talk. He came there for, he had a mission, an assignment. He preached the gospel. And, and uh, unfortunately, I'm going to skip all, all of what he says. And verse 44. And please read that when you have a, a moment today. You can see how Peter contextualizes the gospel for that, for those people. In other words, Peter cannot use... Old Testament, you know, he couldn't quote the Old Testament like he did with the Jewish people. You know, this is a totally strange people. I mean, just think about that strange moment. He's talking to people who have never heard of, you know, 
Christianity or Jesus or, or, or maybe even the Old Testament or anything like that. Anyway, so verse 44, he says, While they were still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who heard the word. Hallelujah. Let the worship team come forward. You know, many times we use all other techniques to, to supposedly invite the Holy Spirit. But look at Peter, just preaching the gospel, preaching the pure, true, full gospel. While he said these things, the Holy Spirit fell on those who heard the word. And the, all these witnesses that Peter brought, right? Verse uh, 45, among those who were circumcised, who had came with Peter, were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit were poured even out on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speak in tongues and extolling God. The same experience uh, at, at, the, at the day of Pentecost. Here the Gentiles are experiencing the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And they're extolling the God. Extolling God that, that the same God that Peter and the apostles and, and this Jewish brethren were worshiping. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And they asked him to remain for some days. I'm so happy to hear that there's an opportunity to get baptized in the coming month. For those, and, and last week and a couple of weeks ago, we talked about this the question you know why do you wait there's some of you that are that you you know Christ as your lord and savior but i think i think unfortunately we have we have told young people to wait as if when they're 18 they're going to truly be saved but if you know in your heart that Christ is your lord and savior if your life has been changed why do you wait Pray about that these days. And so I'm going to conclude. You know, God, we see that God is not a respecter of persons. God works in mysterious ways. He brings about his own timetable. He, he deals with Paul's weaknesses and his, in his, uh, his you know, uh, prejudices, right, in a unique way. He speaks to Cornelius in a unique way. He brings them together. He's doing the same thing with us as well. Just not in such clear terms. We need to be open. We need to open our eyes to see what God is doing in our life. We, think, we always think about the outcome. Oh, the, Jew, the Gentiles hear the gospel. But think about God is also interested in the process as well. He wants to mold us while he uses us to mold others. And that's how God operates. The Holy Spirit is a great equalizer. He falls uh, on the Gentiles. And so those who were uh, filling the Spirit on the Jewish congregation, Jewish side knew, wow, if the Gentiles have the fullness of the Spirit, we are brothers in Christ. We're sisters in Christ. The Holy Spirit brings fellowship like nothing else. The Holy Spirit unites us together. We are, we are in partakers in fellowship of the same Spirit. So we ought not to discriminate against each other if you are a brother or sister in Christ. We are all partakers of the one spirit. And lastly, there's power in the gospel. We do not need to use techniques or we don't need to uh, appeal to other forms to, to change people. There's power in the gospel. I'm not ashamed of the gospel for the, it is the power of God unto salvation for Jews first and then to the Greek. And he uses us to be the, part, the carriers of this precious gospel to the ends of the earth. So I'm asking you, each one of us, if you or I don't preach the gospel, who will do it? If you or I don't preach this precious gospel to our co-workers, who's going to do it? If you or I don't preach the gospel to our classmates, who's going to do it? If you or I won't preach the gospel to our friends, to our relatives, who's going to do it? If you or I don't preach the gospel from pulpits, who's going to do it? Let us reclaim a desire to be the, the preachers of the gospel. How beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Hallelujah. Let us rise in the presence of God and let us worship Him and thank Him for making us, for entrusting us with this gospel. May this name be glorified. Amen.